we've talked an awful lot about materials and their properties and of course how all of that comes out in pbr to give us a realistic look. but there's another very important part to this whole equation and that is the lighting. now there's quite a few things to go through, different lights, different ways of using them and so on and we'll come to that in the tools and techniques section. but when it comes to the basics here there are a couple of elements to lighting that we do want to make ourselves aware of. And the first of these is understanding dynamic range. dynamic range is basically the difference between the darkest thing that we see and the brightest thing that we see. or rather it's how we represent where the cutoff point for black and white is. for instance let us consider all the possible ranges of brightness that could exist. excluding of course total darkness, the complete absence of light. we might have something that's very dimly lit let's imagine a teeny tiny birthday cake candle on the birthday cake for a flea outputting of course just this ridiculously tiny amount of light that's barely perceivable. and then at the other end of the scale let's imagine something like the surface of the sun. something so incredibly bright that it's just beyond blinding. and then let us imagine a scene that contains such an incredible range of lighting value. obviously we take any image of this scene and what the scene will contain irrespective of the objects and colors and everything else is there will be a brightness range present in the image, a brightness gradient that exists in the image as a whole that goes from dark to light, the darkest areas to the lightest areas. usually though not always we would represent you know the darkest as black or near black and the brightest as white or near white. but in a case where we've got a massive range of brightness value we sort of have to clamp that. so for instance here we see a dark to light gradient. when we take an image what we will set is somewhere a black point which we see on the lower of these two gradients and a white point. so this becomes the full range of brightness values that are present in the scene or the shot and this little cutout here with the red line is the dynamic range that is represented. anything darker than the black point appears black and anything lighter than the white point appears white. for instance here we see a range of images all of the same scene and this scene contains a wide range of brightness values. and the only difference between one image and the next is the white and black cutoff points. normally in photography we talk about this as the exposure. down here at the bottom corner where we see the lighter image that is a higher exposure whereas of course up here at the top left corner this is a lower exposure. but really what we're seeing if we look in the bottom right is the black point is set very low and so this foreground of the cacti that is not very bright we are able to see and the white point is also set low. so of course the sky is blowing out there. whereas up here on the top left both the black point and the white point are set much higher as a result due to the increased white point we can see more detail in the sky but due to the increased black point we've lost detail in the foreground there. a common place where we might encounter you know something of this nature is going to be something like this an interior shot. in this case some museum somewhere with a funny looking rock very modern art but what we can see is that whilst the interior here is all nicely illuminated and we've got a good view a good level of brightness of everything in here allowing us to see the scene. we can also see that the outside world is massively brighter than the illumination inside. as such the windows are just whited out completely. this is very common in interiors. we see it a lot in photographs and images. having a well lit interior will often blow out any details from the outside as seen through windows, giving us what just look like these bright white light panels. we see here another example of it, again a shot taken from inside through the window when we have the exposure such that we can see details inside the room, admittedly not an awful lot here. the outside is completely overexposed and if we adjust the exposure such that we can see the details of the outside world then everything inside has become too dark now no doubt some of you will have seen HDR 
photographic techniques. In some cases these can be done in camera, otherwise they're often done in post, in Photoshop and the like, by combining multiple exposures together. And this can be nice because it gives us both the lower exposure details and the higher exposure details all together in the same image. However, it can look a bit weird, especially if it's pushed too far, giving results that can sometimes start to look a little bit surreal. Principally, this is because it starts to violate the kind of dynamic range that we're used to seeing in most photography. Now the human eye does have quite a wide dynamic range. That's why if you were to stand here at this point in Paris and look across the water here on such a time of day, you would with your naked eye see well exposed both the foreground and the sky all at once. The reason photographs adjusted to mimic this sometimes look a little strange and surreal is because the contrast is different to how our eye perceives it. You've stretched the dynamic range of the image from white to black but you haven't stretched the contrast in the same way. So what does this mean for us in terms of doing rendering since of course we've been looking at photography? Well, ordinarily, Lightwave's renderer will behave more or less like a camera. It will have this fairly tight dynamic range. We have, of course, got all of this stuff in materials for PBR. Our lights and everything else work in this PBR fashion. But one of the things with doing photorealistic rendering is that we want our renderer to spit out images that have behaved more or less like photographs. Or put another way, we want our virtual camera to take pictures in the same way as a real camera. As such, you will find that when you get renders out of Lightwave, you have a dynamic range behaviour that is broadly the same as you would expect from most film or digital cameras. Somewhere in the region of five-ish stops of exposure. One of the things that we will wonder, of course, is how do we control this? In a real camera, we can turn exposure up and down. And we do this in a real camera without going into too much detail through altering the shutter speed, the aperture, or indeed the ISO sensitivity, either in a digital camera or by changing film. We'll see that we do have things like shutter and aperture control in our Lightwave camera, but those are for lens effects. Changing those will not change the exposure. What we don't have is a sensitivity or an ISO type control. And so when it comes to actually adjusting our overall brightness, our term of exposure, we generally tend to do this by just changing the lighting values. We turn the lights up when we want brighter, we turn them down when we want darker. Very often we will want a certain balance in our lighting, and we'll look at that a little bit when we talk about artistic lighting afterwards, but we can very easily fiddle that up and down in the render properties using the global light intensity here, which will just ramp all of our lights up or down together, thus giving us something analogous to an exposure control. Of course, if you had backgrounds, you would also adjust those, and if you were using GI, then you can adjust any GI percentage here in line with all of that. Of course, what we can do is also affect the dynamic range of the image itself. Here we see I'm using an HDR image and over there, you know, we're looking at the sky and that's very, very bright. We can see the area behind the camera here being reflected in the ball, which is a more normal exposure. So again, we see this difference of dynamic range. Most commonly, we would do this in post. We would render out our images to a floating point format, 32-bit color. That would capture all of the dynamic range information because of course, even though here in the sky it appears white, and indeed in the reflection of the sky in this ball it appears white, it's not, it's just beyond white. But if we rendered this out, took it into some sort of post to do tone mapping, either in Photoshop or whatever else, then we could reclaim some of that. We do, however, have tools for it available here directly in Lightwave, such as the image filter here of HDR exposure, and that allows you to set your white and black point. You would set the black point higher if you want to capture more of the dark detail, set the white point higher if you want to capture more of the bright detail. Notice this doesn't work in preview, this only works in full render. So if I set my white point here to five and we actually do a full render, then we see that we've reclaimed all 
of that bright detail. We're now seeing, of course, the sky there in blue. We're seeing the bridge is no longer blown out. And of course, the same in the reflections here. Whilst you'll notice that the reflection of that stuff behind us, because we haven't altered the black point, is still as it was previously. All we've done here is to broaden our dynamic range and then, you know, bring that down to between white and black within this image. Now, there is another place where dynamic range and specifically things that go super white will make a difference for us. And that is in anti-aliasing. For instance, we see here I've got an area light. This could be a piece of luminous geometry. It doesn't really matter. But we're looking at it and it's rendering there. So let me just take a full render so I can get image viewer. And if we look at the edges of this light close up, then, you know, we can see how the edge there has been anti-aliased. Because it's, of course, at an angle, it's been smoothed off with the anti-aliasing. However, if we take this light intensity up to, let's say, 10, so now it is super white, you might be able to see it already in VPR, just in case you can't. Let's do another F9. And now look at it. You'll notice that it is not so well anti-aliased. See here the difference between the two. The reason why, of course, is because anti-aliasing is trying to minimize the harshness of contrast between something bright and something dark. Now, even though the area light appears to be white in both of these renders, in the second one it is not. It is super white. It is ten times brighter. As such, the anti-aliasing has more difficulty in cleaning up the edge because this is not the edge of black against white. It's the edge of black against 10 times white. Now, is there much we can do about this? I mean, you know, sure, you can just, you know, increase your anti-aliasing an awful lot, but you'll see that the gains from that are somewhat marginal. Here at an anti-aliasing of 96, we're still not getting a huge amount of difference there. The reason, again, is because this image is then having to be rated from black too white. There are only so many gradations that can be fitted in between. Now, most of the time in most scenes, you probably won't have something this extreme. And thus, a lot of the time, this will, you know, be okay for you. However, on occasions where you do have something about this, what can you do about it? Unfortunately, the answer is not a huge amount. This is a problem that you see in a number of renderers, not just Lightwave, and it is simply because of the fact that you've got super white here, and blending such an edge off is very difficult, because even if you blend the edge down, that edge will still be super white. This area light might be 10 times, as we have here, but when you blend out the edge, that edge is still going to be like, you know, three times, two times white. The result being that it's always hard for the anti-aliasing to come out well. One option that we do have available to us is this little check, limit dynamic range. This will take anything that is super white or super black, if we're looking at the other end of the scale, and just rescale it back down. It won't change the rendering, it won't change the brightness of the light as it is in the scene, illuminating objects and so on. But once all of that illumination has been calculated, it will then bring everything all the way back down to our white point and black point in order that it can then be properly anti-aliased. And so you'll notice that if I turn this on, then you can see straight away, possibly in VPR, the edge of that light gets a lot better. And of course, if we do the render so we can see it close up, there we are. We've got a nice anti-aliased edge again. Now, of course, using this is not without its problems. Because I've now done a limit dynamic range, I've lost all of that super bright information. We see if we come back to this scene and we have the limit dynamic range on and we have the HDR expose on, notice that now all of that sky has just been set as white all of the super bright, the super white information, or super blue, I suppose it was in this case, all of that has been lost. And so when I've increased my white point, when I've scaled down the brights, they've just become grey. 
Similarly, if I were to take this render such that it is into a post-processing application and try to tone map it, I would already be at the white point and so trying to recover information from the brights would just turn the brights or the whites into grey. This is just one of those issues that we have to try and fumble our way around and it's common to many 3D renderers. If you have no intention of doing any kind of tone mapping, if you are not wanting to, you know, try and correct this exposure, do this sort of HDR compression in post, then you're perfectly safe to use limit dynamic range. If, however, you do want to retain that ability, and it's very common if you're trying to do architectural visualization or visual effects work, then you really cannot use limit dynamic range. You have to just pretend it does not exist. And you would then try to deal with this aliasing on edges in post in some way. So there we have it. These are the issues surrounding dynamic range, what it means, both in terms of images and their appearance, both from an artistic perspective, but also from a technical perspective. And we see here the tools and options that we have available to us in Lightwave for dealing with it in different ways, in different circumstances, and some of the little niggles that we just need to work our way around on occasion. Or indeed, the things that we might want to keep in mind when setting up our scene lighting so that we can set things up to try and prevent ourselves running into any of these problems. And as we go further into the training, particularly the project section, you will see us working with lighting in certain ways that helps us to build scenes and lighting setups that work out pretty jolly well in our renders.